Thank you very much, Gabriele. This leads perfectly into my own uh, little speech, which will be used by the other speakers also, probably as an inspiration for some of their lines. We want to sh just show you some pictures. I want to show you some pictures about Guglielmo Marconi, and uh, as Gabriele said, use him as an example, an example figure for uh, one way, because there's not a single way to create new ideas, but one way which is uh, exemplary in many terms. Well, first of all, the start. As Gabriele said, he was a very young man, was about 20 years old or less than that, tried to enter the University of Bologna. Oh, he failed the admission into the University of Bologna. And so the academia, first of all, my fault again, my fault, uh, did not let him become part of the community. So he was trained by a tutor and self-trained by reading the uh, magazines of the time about electromagnetics, her, the work by Hertz, and so on, working in his own laboratory inside Villa Griffone. And I will show you this uh, picture, which is from uh, the museum of uh, Guglielmo Marconi. This is inside Villa Griffone. So uh, some of you have already seen this museum. Some of you can have the chance to see it today or in the next day. So if you have the time, take your time to go outside of Bologna. It's, uh, about uh, 20, 25 minutes drive and see this museum where the room, the so-called Stanza dei Bacchi where uh, Marconi was working at the time has been reconstructed. And there is the window out of which the first uh, obstacle, which we will talk about in a minute, was uh, surpassed by the radio signal. So Marconi was there. He was not at the core of the field. He was in the periphery for sure. He was not the expert. He was very young. All of these elements are important, but I want to, to say that even if you're not young, if you're at the core and you are inside the system, you can still be creative. Why is it, why is it that it's so difficult to be creative when you are an expert at the core and not young? Most of it is because of reputation. You need to be free to make mistakes without hurting your reputation. Once you have, you take away that barrier, and uh, David said that it's a curve. There's a, a moment in time in which you're very free to make mistakes, you're young, then your reputation builds up and you start to be a little more cautious. Then in the end of your career, you're so famous, it doesn't really matter. You go back and have new ideas again. And I think that is true. So Guglielmo was for sure in that place of his life where he could try, he could dare. And uh, what if Guglielmo Marconi ha was born in a, ha in a house in a plain with no hills? He had no opportunity to you know, see any obstacles. But in front of him, of, in front of his house, you open this window and you see La Collina dei Celestini. Celestini's hill. And that was a challenge right in front of him. Let's try to see if the radio signal can go beyond that. So the real invention in my eyes of Marconi is not radio because we know many people had worked on that, many other solutions, yes, 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 but range and going over obstacles, the way the system to go beyond obstacles, the antenna, the overall system to go far and beyond visibility. This is the real contribution of Guglielmo Marconi. Now, he must have had a lot of passion to do that because he had been rejected by the university, my fault again. He had little information, but he was really determined. So drive, focus is the initial state of creative thinking. You need to have a focus, an objective, and you need to have very strong motivation, which will not be put down by the events, which will not be easy to face. Now, he wants to go real far, cross the ocean. Now, he has to build very large premises, goes to Cape Cod, the winds are there. It's winter. He wants to do that in the winter. And all the antennas break down. So he puts up kites. But uh, at the time, 
the physicists did not know about the ionosphere. They only knew that in the far field, the rays were traveling in straight lines, so it was mathematically impossible to go across the ocean. And he was there building these sites, broken down by the winds in the cold, and it was uh, not put down by that. He was putting up kites to bring up the antennas. And he managed, he managed notwithstanding the fact that he was listening to all the lightnings around the world. At every moment in time, there are about a thousand lightnings. And uh, since he was using a super wide band signal, just a spark, a super wide band signal, he was listening to everything that was happening. Not much interference, not not too many people using, there was no cellular telephony at the time, no reuse of frequency, but uh, a lot of lightning. But still he heard the dots and uh, the letter E that came across the ocean. He did that, notwithstanding what other people were saying, notwithstanding the fact that experts were rejecting his own approach and his idea. And he had to face a lot of resistance, not only from... Uh, the press, but also from other companies. So now you come out, you add your idea, you've proven it to yourself that it works, you have to prove it to the world. And that might be one of the most difficult steps, to prove it to the world. The Marconi Fellows, in general, they are not only, not only we look at what kind of invention they made, but what was the impact on the world. All of the Marconi Fellows had a an impact on the world. And Marconi had to, fa had to convince everybody else in front of the fact that uh, the Anglo-American Telegraph Company had a patent and a, let's say, a right to connect uh, Europe and America for 50 years, but they started in 1854. So their, uh, uh, let's say, their license was ending in 1904, and Marconi was doing the experiments at the beginning of that century, of the past century. So he had to say that it was just experimentation, no commercial, nothing commercial there. And once he did that, he proved that it was possible, uh, I've shown you this on the opening day, but uh, not everybody, everybody was here. The paper says, Marconi says he has received them from England, from England this uh, signal, yes, but who are we to believe that that is true? because the letter was prearranged, so he knew what he was uh, supposed to receive, and he says he has received that. Now, how do you convince the world? You need to be marketing-oriented. You need to be marketing-oriented. So the best way is to get famous people, important people, to use the system. And so he managed to have uh, Theodore Roosevelt send a message to King Edward in England, and he received a message back from them, and now all the physicists had to shut up, essentially. How can you say that this is impossible since we are starting, a, well, let's say a political or a commercial service out of that? So it is entirely possible to do that thanks to the ionosphere. And now let's talk about luck, the sheer fact that it's important to be lucky, to be also uh, a good, an inventor that has an impact on the world. Now you know all you know you all know about the Titanic and the fact that uh, radio was a way in which a large number of people were saved thanks to the SOS signal that was sent once the ship was uh, sinking. But you might not know that Marconi himself was supposed to be on the boat. He was supposed to be on the boat, but did not do that because he had other last-minute engagements. So. He was also very lucky, and that, that is an important element. A man with a destiny and a leader. Once you are a creator and you want to have an impact on the world, you have to convince other people. In the end, you're for sure a leader. So creativity and leadership are tied together. And people start having faith in you, and even your little child has faith in you. And he was on his boat, Eletra, with his daughter, the daughter was uh, trying to thread a needle, but she has this father and is the god of wireless. So she says, Dad, when are you going to teach me to sew without a thread? Threadlessly, the wireless god. And the daughter really believed in him, 
so much that uh, she wanted to get away with a threat. Is that possible? Actually, that seems to be just a crazy child idea, but today we have thermal ways to put claws together without a thread. So actually, we were forecasting the future there. So he was visionary, not only the, the daughter, but also himself. He was somebody that uh, could see into the future. I will uh, read it fast. Um, well, I will not read it. He was for, forecasting the advent of the use of radio, not only to uh, distribute information, but also for instruction and recreation. So he saw the application of wireless communications for recreation and for instruction, bringing everybody in a synchronous mode, uh, aligning the culture, aligning the ideas. This is an essential element of the industrial society where everybody needs to think in the same way, like the same objects, have the same taste in order to have a mass production and a mass sale of products. This is an essential element of society. But not only that, he says uh, broadcasting is great, aligns our minds, but the next step, the real value of radio, is in point-to-point, two-way communications anywhere, anytime. Does this sound like a commercial from some telecom operator? Yes, it does, but it was said by Marconi in 1937. So, Marty, I don't want to disappoint you now with the next slide, but mobile telephony, mobile, yeah, the cell phone, maybe Marconi did that already. Here it is, the first. This is the first mobile radio terminal. <laughs> oh. Okay, but not the same size as the one by Marty. So Marty did something which was great as opposed to that. I, was, I would say this is maybe the first vehicular terminal that was developed by Marconi and still not a very small one. But uh, he really saw into the future and uh, the final slide is that uh, uh, he saw all of this for the benefit or, of humanity. And the Marconi Society has this as its motto, pro bono humanitatis. So we do all of this in a spirit of tolerance, sympathy, solicitous of exploiting the achievements of science and human ingenuity for the common well. And this is the real significance of his contribution, and it's also the real significance of the conference. We're talking about creativity, idea generation. For what? What are we doing this for? For the benefit of humanity. That is the end goal. So I thank you very much for your attention.